are listening to Hooked on Startups, where every week you'll hear from some of the most talented, inspiring, and successful entrepreneurs who share their real life stories, how they overcame challenges and failures, and how they mastered success. Get ready for some of the best business tips, tricks and tactics, and some frank, unscripted discussions. Here's your host, Matthew Sullivan. First of all, I'd like to welcome you to the Hooked on Startups podcast so fasten your safety belt scream if you want to go faster um and and as you are um a uh, it says here your i've got your resume it says you're passionate entrepreneur multiple seven figure business owner now does that mean you own over a million businesses because uh, i would imagine if you owned a million businesses you'd be pretty busy i mean how, no. how do you spread or was that just me you know, interpreting that's the revenue. Yeah. So seven figure business, meaning that business, multiple businesses generating uh, multiple millions of dollars. Wow. And how did you manage that? And so tell me what, what is this business? So well, initially, I didn't manage that. Uh, initially, it was, uh, I, I thought it was a good idea. I'm a big fan of Richard Bronson. Um, so he, that guy owns a ton of businesses. I, I used to work for him. Oh, yeah, really? Yeah. For about, uh, yeah. It, so but um, I won't say anything about that because this interview is not about me. But yeah, so he's a he's a really cool guy. He owns a lot of businesses, right? That was, he was my role model when I was younger. So I thought his philosophy was just uh, start a bunch of businesses, and that's yes. what I did. Yeah. And, um, they all failed. It didn't yes. work that way. <laughs> yeah, that's I, a bit, I noticed that's that focus is key, and he's done that after he made a couple of businesses very successful. Then he diversifies. I missed that important link for a few years that you need to have. Uh, you know, cash cow businesses that generate revenue so you can diversify. So that was a massive wake up call. Uh, then I kind of did away with all of the businesses, kept only one of them that was promising and just put everything into that one. And then as it grew, then I started diversifying into separate businesses that goes still parallel to what I do right now, if that makes sense. Yeah, of course it does. So what you're saying is this sort of the heresy to entrepreneurs that you're actually suggesting that they focus on one business. <laughs> yeah. And I actually did a video on that one, the myth of multiple streams of income. Why that's a lie for yeah. most people, because if you can't, if you didn't make one thing work, you have, obviously you're not doing everything right. So you, we suggest you don't take that recipe and apply it to 10 other businesses. So what's not working for one thing, most likely will not work for 10 other things. So spreading, yourself really thinly is not going to help you uh so yeah my suggestion is pick one thing and i know it's very difficult to do you would get distracted right and left with social media and everything is going on but try to stay focused on one thing and it will pay you in dividends and in a relatively short amount of time <laughs> though that's actually incredibly sage advice because i think one of the biggest challenges facing someone who is setting up their own business um is what do you do and it is quite tempting um to try and do be all things to all people. Um, so tell me a little bit more about how you started out, as you mentioned earlier, about um, seeing Richard Branson as this icon of uh, success where you had you know, all of these different virgin companies, how it's actually quite difficult to replicate that. And what brought you to this sort of, you know, this light bulb moment that actually, if I just focused on one thing and, and became very good at that, I'd probably do quite well. Yeah, so I had a corporate job, so I climbed the corporate ladder. Uh, but then I always had a, a, a very massive interest in entrepreneurship. Uh, and I, I had no idea what I was going to do with myself, honestly. I was just learning entrepreneurship, buying courses, the trainings and books and going to conferences. While I had this corporate job and making good amount of money in New York City, my job was to sell. I was a salesperson on the phone, in person call calling, pulling on doors, whatever you can think of. And I was selling financial services products, selling loans, business loans, credit card mm -hmm. machines, payroll and all that stuff. But I, through that training period of me just being a lost soul, I noticed that I, I don't want to work for somebody else. So I kind of sold that idea to myself that I want to own my own business. But I still, I didn't have anyone around me for as a mentor that would tell me how to go about that. I just set up a goal that I would quit my job one day and start my own business. And I just did that. So I burned a ship, started a business. And I, in a short amount of time, I wanted, decided to focus on social media marketing, right? That yeah. was like the hot thing when I started. 
I started a social media company. Then I noticed that, oh, actually, real estate is really fun too. Then I started yes. a real estate company. And talking about real estate, a friend of mine said, you know what, why don't you just do coaching as well? That would really help like coach people. I'm like, ah, that's a bright idea. I started a coaching uh, company. Then a relative of mine, um, you know, during dinner, he said, you know what, I have this bright idea. I'm just missing funds a little bit, just only like, you know, a thousand dollars or so. I want to start a manufacturing company or manufacturing these tiny, you know, trailers, caravans, right? I'm like, oh, that's the right idea. We should partner up. And I started that too, uh, right? Then, so we have these like four companies uh, they are technically functional on paper and um, all of them require marketing, customer service and all of that. And slowly start acquiring customers. I'm like, oh, geez, what do I do now? Which one do I focus? What? And within each one of them, you from you have different options. Do I focus on Facebook for marketing? Yeah, Is it yeah. LinkedIn? Is it Twitter, YouTube? Then that even got me more spread out, right? Though I, with one of them, we're trying YouTube. With the other one, we're doing LinkedIn. Then you got to keep up with how LinkedIn works and all, all the things that change about it. Then, oh, how do we accept payments, actually? Well, that's kind of important. So we got to figure that out. So fast forward like six, seven months, I burned down. Yeah. Like I, I was putting in 18 hours a day, not knowing what I'm doing, missing meetings, missing customer calls. And all that stuff. I'm like, this is madness. I just want to go back and go back to my job. At least yes. they get one thing and I just, I, I was just doing that fine, I think, right? Then I, you know, I, I always believe in the power of mentorship. So at that po uh, point, I had a mentor from uh, Australia. So this gentleman is like really powerful when it comes to identifying the problems in entrepreneurs' lives and directing them. So I was telling him, I'm passionately telling him what's happening. I'll, I'll figure it out. I know this is a process. I'll come out on the other end. It's like, ah, uh, no, you won't. You'll burn out and you'll get depressed. I'm like, wow, that's and a lot. And you'll probably run out of money too. <laughs> yeah, well, I already did at that point. Yeah. But I'm a positive-minded person. I'm reading the book Secret, like, you know, wish yeah. things existence and all that stuff, right? I'm expecting huge money to come to me without me delivering anything to the, to the world. And this guy's like, listen, let's do this simple exercise. I know you're fighting me right now. You think all of these businesses will be successful. Take a legal pad and a pen. Make a list of all the businesses, write down how much time you're spending per hour, uh, per day on each yes, one right. of them and how much revenue they're generating. When I did that, it was a massive shock. It was like face to reality. Three of them were the flat on their faces. I, I had hopes that they would become real businesses. Only one of them, which is our current business, yeah. they had the potential, but the boss was too busy dealing with other businesses. I didn't put in enough time. Yes. So that moment was one of those, you know, it, it, it happens to everyone, the epiphany, I get they called. You notice that, holy cow, what a concept, focus on one thing. Although I'm sure so many people have told me before that focus on one thing, I totally ignored it because I was fixated on the idea of becoming the next which of Ron said, and I'm like, well, if he did it, I can do it too, yeah. without really looking into how he did How it. hard can it be, exactly, yeah, yeah, to like, become a billionaire? It can't be that Exactly. So, you know, and it, there's so many of them. So that was the moment I noticed that focus on one thing and one thing only. Since then, I never let go of that idea because I never want to go back to the period in my life. Yes. There's just a lot of pain associated with that period. And it is because you feel terribly busy and terribly fulfilled in some respects but mm. uh, you know at the end of the day when it's three o'clock in the morning you feel this is the life of the entrepreneur you know i have no family time i'm not making any money um, but i'm incredibly busy and i'm building this um you know this network of companies i'm building an empire right uh, and, and in fact all that's happening is you're just hemorrhaging cash um and, and your wife and children will end up hating you um yeah. and um you know so so it's funny actually because you know, I remember going through the same sort of process where you want to, you want to have, you you get jealous of all these people that had these great ideas. And you go, oh, I I, I want to do that too. I, you know, God, that's a brilliant idea. Hang on, can I do that as well? And you you end up with this sort of um, feeling that you want to collect these businesses, and, right. and you just become rubbish at all of them. Um, so yes, the only thing you become good at is becoming bad at managing businesses. Absolutely. Um, you just hoard ideas because you want to own them. You hear something right. You're like, I can do this better than these guys. They have no idea what they're doing. I'm just jump on it and do that while you have 10 other things. And like you said, it starts affecting your self-confidence. Obviously, it affects, starts affecting your financials and relationship life. Like I was newly married and my wife said, hey, I don't really remember the last time we had dinner together because of your businesses, right? What's really happening? So fast forward, you would, if I continued down that path, you, you, there's no way you can have a marriage it's just, or any kind of solid relationship because you're totally occupied by something. Um, that's why I like it's, it's, 
hustle hustling is fine i know and many many people keep talking about you got to hustle 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 but hustle cannot be a long term strategy you need to have a strategy hustle is temporary so when you have a right when you have the right plan you need to hustle to get it off the ground but if you're working on the wrong plan hustle is slowly killing you and i see people who have been running their business for 5 years and they're still hustling and they think that's business ownership I'm like, dude, that's because you're doing it wrong. Like you shouldn't be hustling at this stage in in your life of business, you know. <laughs> yes, exactly. And it's funny um because um you know, I think in the early days um uh, you know, let, let me let me ask another question. So I was going to go on a, on a completely different route then, but you ended up running or creating a business that was very similar to the company that you just left. Mm-hmm. And so my question is people talk about passion so they talk about entrepreneurship and passion and you know which I think is a much overused word um do you find that you become passionate about something when it's successful or do you think you have to have a passion for something before you can start it I think everyone when you don't have any levels of measurable success your passion is in making money because you're operating in the survival mode right so everyone can talk this big game of oh I always had a mission to save a thousand kids or help a million people but when you're trying to survive that's very rare that that's your mission you're just trying to get a business off the ground right and you're going back to what you know what i know was selling business loans and alternative lending but what i haven't noticed is that what served me really well as a salesperson was also an amazing industry as a business owner too so you can't just explain that by passion it's a lot of research to find out i was passionate about saving myself and my family uh, from financial ruin because i came from a low income family and my and my, my father came from a low income family my grandfather came from a low income low income family so i was trying to break that or well, if yes, you call yes. it curse so, and so, yeah, yeah. be wealthy the cycle right so that was my passion now it wasn't to serve humanity or anything like that at that point but when you start becoming successful your passion your desire shifts too now you notice especially me i've noticed that hey i make a lot more money when i solve real serious problems for people yeah. if i create or design or redesign or reinnovate my product to help these people get better faster results the the second order of consequences of that is me making more money yes, so when yes. you do notice that you're like holy cow so if i just focus on customer success like Jeff Bezos says that like create a customer centric company that's what that means so you just creating a company that focuses on the desires of of the customers and the potential outcomes you want to get through the use of your product or service right yeah, so once yeah. i noticed that my passion has shifted from just me 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 to well i need to find ideal customers but i got to give them something that they like they have never seen before and that will transform their life so then that becomes i think going back to your point the whole passion thing has stages right so it's very rare for someone to claim that they're passionate about building the next the next facebook when they're going through a massive financial trouble because you yeah. can't just ignore that there's an elephant in the room right yeah. you're you're about to be ruined financially and it has a lot a lot of emotional benefits to it so i mean you know if your house is burning down you're going to be passionate about putting out that 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 the fire right not yeah. just go build something else So I agree with you. it's an overused buzzword like do what your 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 passion takes you do what you love and all that stuff but there are stages to it at the stage that our company we're running an eight figure company right now uh, as an e-learning company in the business lending industry yeah I would say 99% of our focus is on customers like how do we keep the customers longer on our platform how do we have them get success so they talk about their success so that builds us more customers and how do you have more transformations and what not like similar examples on Tony Robbins right so it's he he's not i mean if he wanted to just do it for the money he would have quit long time ago he doesn't really need it at this point but it is just that flywheel effect of continuing that cycle that kind of feeds itself over and over again you mentioned Jeff Bezos Tony Robbins Richard Branson um when you're starting out in business sometimes it's quite difficult to see the relevance Mm-hmm. of some of the things that they say. You mentioned Jeff Bezos talking about the importance of 
you know, customer centricity. Yeah. Um, at what point did you begin to realize the relevance of what these people are saying and how, um, in other words, how it, it, it actually does make sense when to start with you hear it, it's almost like sort of words that don't have any real relevance. But um, at what point did you start realizing what that actually meant? And what do you think is the most important piece of advice that you've picked up recently or, you know, over your journey that has resonated and sort of stuck with you? Yeah, that's a great question, actually. So you have to pick mentors, uh, different mentors at different stages of your career, right? So when I first started out, when I didn't know anything about business, I focused on Richard Branson. But I totally misunderstood him because I wasn't at a level to understand what he was talking about or the businesses that he built. I didn't even care about Amazon or their business model. I didn't spend time understanding that, right? Because it was not relevant to me at all at the stage that I'm in. But when, uh, you know, the, 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 the epiphany moment when some, my, my coach called me out on that, that guy was focused on helping someone go from zero to $50,000 per month. That is very relevant. Because I was at zero, right? So it, you got to find the right person for the situation that you're in. As you grow, your mentors change. Now, I'm not with him anymore. Uh, I am with working with other mentors. Uh, my you know, strategy on choosing a mentor, I want to work with people who are at least 10 times bigger than I am as far as the, the business or business acumen or their past experiences and whatnot. So I didn't understand Jeff Bezos. I'm, I'm still not claiming I fully understand what he does. But I didn't, start, I didn't start understanding him and his philosophy, I would say, until like last year. Mm -hmm. when I, uh, Amazon Everywhere, I think that's the, the name of the book. When yes. I started reading that, that's when it dawned on me that, oh, what a concept. If you keep your customers happy, you make more money or you grow and you make more money for them. So that's something we all know on the surface level. Sure, customers drive, take care of your customers. But the application of that to real life, to our own business it doesn't sink in until you reach certain milestones in, 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 in your business, right? And uh, that's the same thing. I never cared about the business model of Google. I know they're successful. They're the top search engine. But when I started making strategic hiring decisions, I wanted to find out how they hire people. They're known for that. They're known for their meticulous system of hiring the right people and building the right culture within the organization. Yeah. So it, it was not relevant to me until that moment that I needed to hire someone where I will be paying probably six figures or more. You can't randomly hire someone for that position. But when I first started out, I was looking for virtual assistants where I can pay two, three dollars an hour. I mean, how you can go wrong, but it doesn't really hurt you that much. You just go through the process of hiring somebody else. But that's, I think, well, to answer your question, it changes, right? So that's yes. why we got to stay plugged into whatever community you belong to. If you consider yourself as a startup, what is happening in bigger companies and different stages? Don't just focus on Jeff Bezos because you might not get 95% of what he's doing right now. In fact, like me, you might misunderstand the whole thing and make a lot of mistakes, right? So it's like the people are always, if you look online, people want to know what, um, you know, um, um, it's stock investor. I'm drawing blank uh, on his name, Warren Buffett. They yes. want to know, I want to know what Warren Buffett is buying right now. Well, that's not really relevant to you right now. He's buying in the quantities of five, ten billion dollars and he's already made the buying decision five months ago and it's now being released right now. You go buy it right now with your ten thousand dollars will not make it relevant, right? But if you want to know what Warren Buffett is buying right away, as if that will make a lot of difference for them. So that's why relevancy is really, really important. It's really important that you need to have like layers of mentors. Yes, uh, yes. So that way, not only you're looking at the top five, you're looking at somebody who can help you at your immediate level right now. But also, I think that is one of the biggest challenges because as an entrepreneur, um, you have to have that mindset that you are right. This is my vision. I'm going to make it work. So you have to have that sort of bullheadedness on one side. It's very difficult to balance that with the emotional maturity to be able to say, actually, I need a mentor. Mm -hmm. I need someone to bounce these ideas across um, to make sure that I'm not believing too much of my own PR. Now, was there a particular moment when you realized or when you thought, actually, I should probably 
see whether or not someone else agrees with me? Or is that something that you've always believed that, that you know, you, one should have the humility and the sensibleness or the, the you know, the, 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 as I said, the emotional intelligence to be able to yeah. go to someone and, you know, open the kimono, as it were? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. So most entrepreneurs are usually their A type personalities, right? So they want to do their own thing. They're overconfident. They, so it's like you said, it's very difficult for that type of personality to accept that they're missing something and they need to search outside and ask for help. That's why the failure rate of small business is super high. A, a lot of that, yeah, the product is important, the location is important, what you do is important. It starts with the entrepreneur because your business is a reflection of who you are and your, your lifestyle and what you do, right? So yeah, I had for a very long time, I would have the mentors, but I would not really apply what they teach me. I would, instead, I would fight them. Like just yes. think of the scenario. I, I hire this mentor to help me. They try to help me, but I would try to sell them on my version of the plan and why that's a great idea. They'd be like, yeah, we respect that. But what you're not seeing is that it's not freaking working. Like, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> You're like, no, 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 it's not working right now, but it will work in six months. And yes. it will be like, I went through a few people because I would always try to sell my idea to Were them. Were you waiting Although, for the person who gave you the advice that you wanted to hear? Absolutely. Yes. It wasn't until I found uh, my style of, because you got to, we all, we all have similar personalities, but different personalities, right? My style of mentorship is to have someone who's going to call me out. Yeah. If someone is going to give me a pat on the back and mo I don't need motivation. I don't need like a motivational type of mentor. I need someone who can be like, Matthew, you're wrong. Here's why you're wrong. Now go yes. back and fix it. So that way I can go back and logically think about it and be like, oh man, he's right. But if someone is like, dude, I love what you're doing. This is awesome. Yeah, keep doing it. You'll be fine. That's the worst kind of mentor for me because I don't lack the motivation. I yes. usually just resist too much on my own idea. Someone needs to kind of hit my head and be like, dude, like, just time so you've to got wake the up. the motivation and the momentum. You just need the science yeah. behind it. Science. Now, is that something? Because you talked about um, earlier, you in the you know um, some time ago, you had this idea to set up a coaching company. But in your business today, um, is that one of the key sort of pillars when you work with people to deliver truth and no holds, no frills, yes. um, methodology. So rather than, and, and how would you say that you compare to the traditional sort of, um, you know, coaches who who try and, I'm not talking about specific mentors, but the, yeah. the coaching industry as a whole seems to be filled with a certain type of person who may not be predisposed, predisposed to deliver the truth. Yeah, so that's an awesome point. That's one of my problems with the whole coaching industry, right? What's happening in the coaching industry? Everyone is, everything is about making the other person feel good about yeah. themselves, their current situation and what's happening right now and this positive, bright future and outlook. Uh, that's the, I, I try really hard to separate myself from that crowd. Maybe certain individuals need that, but if I were that type of mentor, I would be conflicting with my own personality in return, that would that would not be transparent. That would not be authentic, right? So if you ever watch any of my webinars or trainings, it usually starts out with, listen, this is not for everybody. Yes. <laughs> I'll be really, really direct with you and tell you what's working, what's really not working. And uh, if you are really like soft skin and you cannot tolerate hearing the truth, this is probably not for you. Because I do weekly calls with my customer network and say, rapid fire Q and a session, right? Yes. That works. We've been doing it ever since we launched this product and they, they, for a straight hour, they just ask me anything. I just provide answers. Right. Yes. But that's with that consensus that I can, I can, for you to, if you give yourself the freedom to provide someone a direct response that will help yes. them, that saves so much on the BS and also on the time, because I'm not concerned whether I'm going to break their heart or not. If they know me, they know that my intention is not to target or attack Matthew personally. My intention is to help them with the question they ask me, right? Yes. So over time, we started attracting people who see it that way yes. and repelling those who are a little bit on, more on the sensitive side or they need traditional coaching who would just make them feel good. Because my call to action is if you're at point A, you're not happy, I'm not going to motivate you to stay there. You got to go to point B. You got to define that. If you yeah, can't yeah. do it on your own, well, you need help. 
Okay. So that's totally opposite of what's being happening in the coaching industry. A lot of times they're like, your point A, that's okay. You're not actually doing that bad. High five and you'll be fine. Just stay put, stay put and just, I don't know, read a couple of, uh, you know, um, affirmations or read this book and read that book and you'll feel better about yourself. Well, honestly, in certain situations, people are driven by pleasant, pleasure or fear, right? Yes. I myself, I, 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 my motivation is fear, fear of going back to where I was, being poor, yes. being broke and that feeling. So feeling just pleasant about today's situation doesn't help my growth. I'm constantly, I need to be pushed out of my comfort zone, right? So the people that I coach, they are in that mindset. That's why we're attracting those type of people. That's why I do believe in that type of thing. I will not teach anything that that's in conflict with my personality, but you're hundred percent right. That's the whole industry. Most of it at least is designed to help people settle and be happy where they are, which is, yeah. Totally, I totally disagree with that. <laughs> and I, I do too, actually, because I th well, I, I disagree with the effectiveness of feeling comfortable. Mm -hmm. And you know, there's this sort of metaphor that if a shark stops swimming, it dies. You know, because mm -hmm. it doesn't get the 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 throughput of the oxygenated water in its lung. The lungs or the gills work in a different way. So, to a certain extent, I completely um, share with you that feeling that um, if one doesn't create or drive oneself every day then the moment you start sitting back and feeling comfortable that's when the the tidal wave of uh, yeah. you know of uh, of things that will go wrong sort of wash over you so how do you how do you how do you teach that or do you just have to uncover that and and, and most importantly how do you get um because the industry that you're in is a very specific industry uh -huh. um you know how how do you how do you get people to f how do you teach people to just to focus 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 and and feel that fear and and you know are you trying to mold people into your into your way of doing things or do you think that there are I'm sorry there's like 15 questions tied up into that one I'm, I'm just, I, you know, going off in all sorts of different tangents yeah, yeah I get the main idea and and that's that's something I thought about a lot honestly so when we had the first version of our training platform it was mostly focused on the product how do you do lending how do you fund deals how do you make money and it, it bothered the heck out of me because you're attracting people who don't understand entrepreneurship, they just focus on the material aspect of running a business, right? I said, something is very wrong here. Like, yeah, I can teach the mechanics of how to fund a deal and make a lot of money. But if someone doesn't understand how to think like a business owner, how if they don't understand the concept of consistency or compound interest of time put into an effort or single-mindedness on one topic or focusing on one thing, Everything else is kind of temporary. Like I can teach somebody skills, but I can't teach them the principles, right? Yes. So it's very difficult. Like it's like, you, you know, at this age, I'm not going to bring someone and try to teach him, oh, lying is bad. Don't lie, right? It just comes with the package, but I can teach them how to, you know, do funding. So on the second version of the, what we call the blueprint, the training, the beginning of the training, the first five, six lessons is all about mindset. I said, listen, you're, you're dying to know about the product, but if, unless you skip it, unless you go through this part and kind of um, digest it, you will never be successful long term. You're going to have this roller coaster effect. You're going to be successful one day, it's going to go down. But I want you to, I want to train you to think like an entrepreneur, uh, understand the truth, face the truth, uh, understand your current situation, come to peace with that. So that the first, uh, first entire module. This is a big module is on uh, teaching people the right mindset. So that was very transformative for our community. Now, everyone who's coming into the blueprint, a lot of them know a lot about me because I'm the, uh, my face is the brand of the company pretty much, whether I like it or not, that's just how it is. And they know a lot about my philosophy. When they come in, they're expecting to immediately learn about, all right, I got somebody who needs 20 K. How do I fund it? Like, yes, no, 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 yes. no. We'll get to that. You'll learn that. But let's, align you properly to be a successful business owner and they i i and that lesson is supported with a lot of facts and science from the past it starts from like 1700s and why that's important the magical compound interest the message to 
time and effort and why our memory is so weak. So we can't just go off of our memory. We forget a lot of things. So we need to go off of principles. So when they go, once they go through that, then module th two is about the products and services. After we made a switch to that one, that has been really instrumental in us attracting amazing individuals yes. for our standards. And now they're applying those principles and lessons. And that's why our community is so helpful to each other, which is in, that in the financial services industry, it's unheard of, right? Yes. Everyone looks at this industry as wolf eats wolf, you know, uh, uh, then you have the famous movie of uh, Shark uh, not Shark Tank, Wolf of Wall Street, yes, exactly. boiler room mentality, either they buy or they die. And we're doing like 180 degree different, the different approach than that. Uh, so that helped us do that just by what you mentioned, focusing on how to think properly before yes, yes. Uh, focusing on what to think about. Because there are many elements of a successful financial services business mm -hmm. but all of them really i think um revolve around the ability to acquire and retain customers um and so is that would you agree that that's the sort of the primary objective to to be able to create a customer base to be able to f consistently find and service new customers is that the major challenge or would you say that there's another bigger challenge in in your business um, in our business, the business is you, the consultant, right? Yes. Because the opposite of a business loan broker, the, the broker that we train, is someone applying to Bank of America, Wells Fargo, a major corporation, and calling a 1-800 number. Yes. I tell all of my brokers is that product is you as the consultant. Yeah, You have in your arsenal all the different lending options, but those are the features and the products. But the benefit is... There's a consultant who, yes. whose goal is to serve the customers in a very consultative manner and educate them. That has a lot of value, both you know, emotional yes, yes. value and also monetary value, right? And also in marketing, like you said, you got to be in the business of acquiring a new customer. But yes. the, um, the most expensive part of marketing is acquiring your customer for the first time. Yes. So when you provide repeat services to the same customer, it doesn't have as much cost, almost yes. no cost at all. So we're training our brokers to be in the business of repeat income and repeat business. Yes. Why? Because it's relevant in our industry. If a business needs funding and you provide them funding, do you not think they will need funding again? They will yes. need funding yes. again in six months, eight months, a year, two years, five years, 10 years. If you look at a business model in a very transactional manner it treats you that way right yes. so you're always in that hunting mode of i gotta i gotta get more customers and that makes you harsher on the phone because then you gotta be a hard closer i gotta close because there's no other opportunity whereas if you're the business of growth and scale through service then on the front end you can be more selective on who you work with you can be a lot more comfortable and you can pretty much do your business from wherever you want because you know that you're not waking up with zero income at the beginning of every single month because we have options that pay your residual income, repeat income. And average, we know, statistically speaking, a small business needs funding up to three times a year. So yes, technically, yes. if you have 10 clients, nothing major, that's 30 loans you can fund yes. as long as they remember who you are. Absolutely. That's why you need to invest into your personality. So there will never be a situation where someone will confuse one of our brokers with some guy from Wells Fargo, right? Because that's just a phone number. I'm not saying they're bad or anything. It's just that's no, you, the value. Yeah, I can tell. Yeah. It's it's you know it's personality as opposed to sort of the the mass manufacturer. And and just a slightly different question. I mean, here we are in you know August 2021, um, sort of either post pandemic or mid pandemic or you right. Know, you know, depending on your view, how have you seen your business change in terms of the demand for financing and the type of people that are looking for financing today compared to where we were, let's say, you know, 12, 14 months ago before, yeah. before the pandemic really took, took grip. So obviously I don't think any of us have been through a pandemic before, right? So there's no past data, at least in relative past for us to compare and prepare for it. So when it hit us, 
we didn't know how, what was going to happen. Is it going to affect us in a positive note or are we just going down just like most companies? Like I had no clue. Sure. And I told my team, we're not going to change anything. We'll pretend this is not happening. We'll just keep serving the client. So we're not going to make yes. any crazy moves because this is totally unpredictable. Yep. But we've been saying for years that most jobs are not secure. You got to be an entrepreneur. You got to have your own business. Maybe it will be more relevant through this because people will face the reality. This is exactly what happened. Most people lost their jobs and their income and they got fired and let go from some of the most secure industries, right? Yes. So that served as a massive wake-up call. And that's, we had a massive wave of people coming back to us. They initially checked it out, maybe checked it out, checked us out a year ago. I said, nah, I think I'm doing fine. I'm getting paid six figures at my job. Now you don't have that anymore. You notice that, oh crap, this can actually happen. So they were right. So we had, we experienced massive growth on the interest on the program, but also massive growth and interest of funding as well. Yeah, so yeah. The, the industry has been going through a, a period like never seen before because big banks are restricting access to the funds, just like they do all the time when there's any kind of crisis, right? That opens up, uh, you know, massive opportunity for alternative lending companies like us, uh, people needing massive amount of money, cash, and they have very limited place to go uh, yeah. to get it. Banks do not really serve them anymore, right? They want to wait until everything is calm and they're going to hear from they're the Fed. They're managing risk, aren't they, primarily? Yeah, yeah. So, which is understandable. They're publicly owned companies, so they need to manage their risk and all that stuff. But we don't have to deal with that. So that's creating massive opportunities both for us, but for the brokers to come into the platform because, well, every business is hungry to get cash right now. Yes. Yeah. And, it, it, and it, again, your um, do you see the pandemic permanently changing the way that we do business or do you think i mean and the reason i ask this is because the people that you work with have found themselves in a position where they weren't anticipating being out of a job mm -hmm. or looking at this um and the ability for us now to run businesses remotely and to grow businesses remotely um do you think that this is the beginning of a significant change in the way that businesses do business in certain aspects, yes. In certain aspects, no, honestly. So we, people have very short-term memory. If this is the end of pandemic, um, it, it, it hasn't been a massively long period of time, right? It's, we, it came, hit us, we were done in two, two years and done. Five years from now, I think barely anyone will remember the consequences of what happened. Life will go on, right? Yes. But if this is still going on and we're in the middle of it, that's a different story, right? So people remember the plague or 2008. <laughs> Those of us who can cast their minds back to 1462. <laughs> yes. You're right. Everyone still, they, they know what it refers to because it left exactly. a massive mark on humanity, right? Most recently, 2008 recession, it took almost a decade to get through. That's why people still remember that. Although we can discuss how much they learn from it. That's a different story, but they still do remember it. That's how I look at it. I'm like, if this is the end of it, this is pretty short. I know we lost a lot of people. A lot of people's lives have been impacted, but I'm, I don't really foresee any major uh, pivot. Uh, yes. Maybe on the topic you mentioned, yeah, they're more acclimated towards working virtually than putting themselves in an office. We're 100% virtual right now, but we made a decision prior to pandemic. Yes. Now it just turned out to be right decision and we'll stay you know, remote as, as long as we can, depending on the size of the team. I think people are going to be adjusting to a hybrid model. They're going to want to have their key players in the office, everyone else remotely, and change to that structure. But as far as how they do business, I don't foresee any long-term massive changes. Yes, it is an exciting time, though, just for entrepreneurs and smaller businesses, just to because I think there's a new layer um, emerging where people can build businesses without having to go through that same expense of getting offices. So I think there is, you know, it, that sort of gap has been created, which is quite exciting for entrepreneurs. But absolutely. I mean, when you think about what's happening the past couple of years before Regis's and WeWorks were yeah. around, you needed to get yourself on a lease for five years to 10 years Jeez. to get an official office. And people notice that's crazy. I don't know how long I'm going to be around. I might not need it. Then they gave the, you know, they gave birth to B-Works and Regis's. 
Right now, people notice, ah, maybe I don't even need that. I just need yes, to invest. Yeah, that, that's a transition away from that. And you see those companies are kind of struggling financially because there's not as much demand. So this is not, I don't think this is happening because of the pandemic. This was going to happen anyways, but it kind of p- pandemic accelerated that process of people noticing, oh, well, this is just an extra cost. And, yes. and that was also the reason you needed to have an office back then your customers wanted to see that they were giving your, I guess they were giving you legitimacy based on where you're located. Right now I can talk to somebody and tell them I'm working from home. They don't freak out. That's it's just- that's a th- Exactly. That's the thing that, that um, I'm, you know, I'm really pleased about. But all of these things make the sort of business that you're in, you give it a much greater chance of success because people now realize that the leap from working for someone else in an office to working at home for themselves that gap has now shrunk, so um, it's you know it's now more possible. So it must be quite an exciting time for you in terms of the numbers of people and the opportunities that you can now provide to your customers. Absolutely, because before we used to uh, we we had to paint a picture of what would have happened if they lost their job. Right now, we don't even need to tell them anything. They're like, "Hey, you see what's going on?" Right? They're like, "Yep." All right. So you yes, see that? So, yes. Yeah. <laughs> So that's that's brilliant. But this is all very, very you know interesting and, and sage advice, Oz. But um, I'm going to move on now to my questionnaire section. All right. Now, now, I'm not sure if you've seen the questions. I'd actually be rather delighted if you haven't. But I have not. No. Uh, go, good. Excellent. Good. So I have ten um, quick fire questions here. All right. Um, which um, will remove all of the layers and show you for the person you truly are <laughs> um or, or they won't um anyway question number one oz Konar, what is your favorite word effort and what is your least favorite word excuse <laughs> number three what are you most excited about right now Student success. And number four, what turns you off right now? Laziness. Number five, what sound or noise do you love? Classic music. And number six, what sound or noise do you hate? Baby crying. <laughs> I have two kids, by the way. I love yeah, kids. No, no, that's right. Yeah. It's just, God, <laughs> so just, you know, what's wrong now? Yeah. yeah. Number seven. What is your favorite curse word? Uh, I don't know if I can say it, but fuck. Yeah, you can. You can. This is, don't worry. No one listens to this, so you're absolutely <laughs> fine. <laughs> yeah, that is great. And I, I completely agree. The, the greatest word ever invented. Number eight. What profession other than your own would you like to attempt? Surgeon. Ah, very, very interesting. Number nine. What profession would you not like to attempt? Carl's professor. <laughs> That's right. It's not really that. Or accountant, unless, of course, you are an accountant. <laughs> um, and the final question, if heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? Good job, son. <laughs> now go back. That's right. That's my <laughs> lesson. So Oz, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on. It's just been so interesting to hear about the business you built, your your attitude, you know, you know the the truth, basically, word, as they say. So um, how do people get hold of you? How do people find out more about um, everything that, uh, you, you, you know, the, the courses, the teaching and um, everything that you do? What's the, what's the best way for them to contact you? Yeah, I mean, this has been amazing. You have uh, one of the best questions I've ever heard so far. From- <laughs> that's right. Yeah. I just made it up. Sorry. Yes. Uh, that's awesome. So that means you're an amazing listener. That's great. So we try to keep things simple in our business. So we have just one source for everything. If, you, if you're interested about uh, what we do, it's businesslendingblueprint.com. That's our website. So you see my, you see my social tags. There are videos, our free, we have a ton of free content. You don't have to buy our program. You can still get highly educated on what we do here. Uh, so that would be the resource, businesslendingblueprint.com. That's brilliant. Great. Thank you once again. I'll put all those uh, details uh, on the website and the show notes. And um, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on. And uh, I really look forward to staying in touch and you know following your progress. Likewise. Amazing. Thanks, Matthew. 
You are listening to Hooked on Startups, where every week you'll hear from some of the most talented, inspiring, and successful entrepreneurs who share their real life stories, how they overcame challenges and failures, and how they mastered success. Get ready for some of the best business tips, tricks and tactics, and some frank, unscripted discussions. Here's your host, Matthew Sullivan. 